Hi, I'm Phil Town. I'm Danielle Town. And we're here to talk about money and rule one. And rule one being that thing that Warren Buffett said about investing, that there's two rules of investing. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. So we're really out to try to figure out how do you go about following rule one, following the advice of the greatest investors in the world, and apply that. Is that possible for just a regular guy or a regular gal to do? Exactly. How on earth is a regular person supposed to do this mysterious stuff? Yeah, particularly when those guys will tell you that if you're not going to learn how to invest, um, you should just put your money in an index fund. Yeah. You know? And so they're, they're basically pushing you away from the notion that you could do this. So it's a really interesting question about whether uh, a, a regular person can actually invest like a Warren Buffett or a Charlie Munger. And to me, it is a question. Yeah. It, I'm, I mean, not, really, I'm not convinced. It's a legit question. Honestly, it is. Um, but, but the problem, and actually, if you could just put your money away in a mutual fund and do okay with it long term, you know, the, that would be great. I mean, just put your money in there, ride through the bumps. That's really Buffett's advice. You know, go through the ups and downs in the market. In the long run, you'll come out okay. The problem is there's probably in the ballpark of of 50 million baby boomers who don't have any money to retire with or don't have enough and they're looking at the rate of return in the stock market and just going this is not going to get me where I need to go. Yeah. Plus you, you got an awful lot of people who are quickly. your age who are like, "Hey man, I don't want to work till I'm 65 or 75 well, or whatever the new new era is." Yeah, it's not just that though. I mean, everybody I know has student loans. We're all paying student loans. And that's where the money is going. I mean, I'm not saving very much money. Um, and you're a lawyer. You get yeah, paid really good. Yeah, and I'm really paid good. law school loan. That's what, and, right. Yeah, because I refuse to pay I'm them I'm a lawyer. All. My sister's a doctor. Yeah, so I yeah, mean. Yeah, so everybody's, you know, putting their money towards loans and towards saving for a down payment. And, you know, maybe it's a separate issue, but it's it's really difficult to think about investing at this point in life. And so I think there's going to be a point where people need to be getting a higher return than the market rate. Yeah. And shoot, if it could be done, and by the way, there are a number of people who are doing it, so I know it can be done. Um, but if it can be done just by the average person, if the average person could put a little time into this and learn how to do this, then if you started doing this when you're 22, 25, something like that, you don't have to worry about staying in a career. You don't have to worry about struggling to you know, keep up with whatever's going on in your career and whoever's running your life and whoever you're working for, you'd have enough money to retire at 40, 45 years old. At some point, that might be true. I don't know if it's going to be true that early for most people because you have to constantly like save enough money to put then money into the market to then make the returns. Well, yes and no. I mean, you remember that how I did it, because I'm your dad, so you kind of probably watch this happen, is that I raised money from other people. Once I got a track record and, and had experience, then, I don't know, I'll put it like this. Warren Buffett said, if you have a good track record, you could be on an island in the middle of shark-infested waters and people will swim to you to give you their money. And that's exactly how he started and how every other uh, fund manager that I know that invests like I do started up. They they didn't start with family money, and all these guys didn't come out of like super rich money. They just got a good track record and then started bringing in other people's money. So I really do think it's possible to even do this as a part time thing and um, and crank it up. So if you're, by the way, I mean, heck, do the math. Let's say you could save $12,000 a year pre tax into some kind of either a Roth or an IRA, and, um, and you were making 25% a year on that which is our target number, right? 26%. And that's a huge number. Huge number. Giant number. But it's absolute... I mean, to put this in context of what Warren Buffett did with small amounts of capital, not very long ago, he said that if he had a million dollars to invest, that actually said, if I only had a million dollars to invest, I'd be making 50% a year, guaranteed. 50% a year. Why is that? Because he's a genius. Okay, but why is that? You mean, why could he make 50% yeah. a year? Yeah. Because he knows how to buy really good companies when they're on sale. So if you can buy $10 bills for $5 and do it over and over again, 
you can make an awful lot of money fast. And in fact, I mean, last year, our risk capital portion of our portfolio was at 55%. So why does it matter that he's investing only a million? Oh, sorry. Got off the track there. Um, Because large amounts of capital are harder to employ. It's harder to allocate for high rates of return when you've got billions of dollars. So he's at 120 billion right now. And as a result, it's tougher for him to find investments that'll move the needle because they have to be so much larger. If you're starting with a million dollars, you can move the needle with a hundred thousand dollar investment. Meaning he has to put that money into larger companies exactly. that can handle that kind of investment. Yeah, so he's looking for multi-billion dollar investments. Um, and those are really hard to find on sale, right? So it's not like you're finding ten dollar bills on sale for five. You're looking for, you know, two hundred billion dollar bill on sale for a hundred billion. That's that's not going to escape the notice of good investors, right? Okay. And what we want to talk about today is how to determine if that hundred dollar bill or two billion dollar bill <laughs> is on sale or not? Is that what we're discussing? Yeah, is it on sale or not? And the reason we want to talk about that is because, as you guys have heard so far, we've been running this one-minute piece of of phenomenal investing advice from Charlie Munger to the BBC a couple years ago. So let's let's do it again because it lays out the context for us. So we thought this would be a four-part episode. (laughs) Or four, sorry, four episodes. We never, we, we may never leave this subject. We may never leave this. You. Every time you listen to us, you may have to listen to Charlie for one minute. You, you'll have it memorized like we do. Yeah. So let's do it again, so just so we got the right this is context. Charlie Munger on the BBC, um, and he's just going to talk for one minute about the principles of investing. We have to deal in things that we're capable of understanding, and then. Once we're over that filter, we have to have a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage. And then, of course, we would vastly prefer a management in place with a lot of integrity and talent. And finally, no matter how wonderful it is, it's not worth an infinite price. So we have to have a price that makes sense and gives a margin of safety considering the natural vicissitudes of life. That's a very simple set of ideas. And the reason that our ideas have not spread faster is they're too simple. The professional classes can't justify their existence if that's all they have to say. I mean, it's all so obvious and so simple. What would they have to do with the rest of the semester? And last time, the last time we were talking about, you know, the the paradigm that exists in the market to this day, um, that price is value, that the amount of movement of a stock price relative to the S and P five hundred is um, called volatility, but it is a a uh, proxy for risk, and that there's a common notion that you cannot. Uh, since all prices and values are this, values equal prices and prices equal values, there's this notion that you can't get a good deal in the market. You, everything is priced properly. Um, and therefore, if you want to do a better than market rate of return, the only way you can do that is to take a lot more risk and try to time it properly so you're in it when the risk is, when it, when it goes up and you're out of it when it goes down somehow. And this has become the... Um, the paradigm of the entire stock market, 99.9% of all fund managers running your mutual funds, um, anything other than an index, is invested short term. Like a long term hold for, for one of the big mutual funds is th- like three months. I mean, actually, most of them don't hold much longer than a month. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me from what we were discussing in the last episode about um, efficient market hypothesis and how... It seems to be accepted, and you seem to agree, that long-term efficient market hypothesis is true. There is is an efficient market long-term. Yes. But short-term, there is not. Yet some people still think that there is. So it sounds like you have to, basically, these guys have to be investing short-term in order to make any money. Yes. If, If you believe in efficient market theory, then the only way you could possibly do better than everybody else is to guess properly that you're in a volatile stock, it goes up, and you get out 
and avoid it when it goes down. And amazingly, this is exactly how the market works. The Russell 2000 index, is uh, the RUT, um, is more volatile than the S&P 500. The Russell index is 2000 small stocks. And so what you see is fund managers moving into the Russell when they think that, that the economy is going to be good and small cap stocks will go up fast. They'll move into there, try to get a higher rate of return than the overall market, and then move back to the S&P 500. What are small cap stocks? Oh, very good. Small cap stocks are stocks that are valued like the, if you multiply the stock price times the number of shares they have, you get what's called a market cap or market capitalization. Um, and the market capitalization of small cap stocks runs from something like, I'm probably a little off here, but something around $200 million, um, in the market up to a billion dollars, say. So roughly, I might be off in the exact numbers, I forget exactly, but they've sort of drawn the lines there between 100 or 200 million and about, and about a billion in market capitalization. Those are small caps. And then it goes up from there for the S&P 500 and the Dow. But the, obviously, and the smaller these companies are, um, the more and, and the more of them there are, there is more movement and their stock prices because they're they're less actively traded, and because they're more act go through more stuff as a small company in terms of their business. So someone so they tend to be more volatile. A chunk of stock of a small cap stock is going to make a difference in that stock price. Exactly. Relative well, to the total amount of stock that's actually being sold for exactly. that company. So these guys will buy in there and they'll drive those things up because they're big investors, and then they get out and they drive them down like crazy. So the basic idea is you have to be a momentum investor, and your mutual fund is invested that way, based on, I think this part of the market's going to go up, so I'm going to move my money to that. And when I do, because I have so much money invested in a mutual fund, it moves it up. But the big guys can move the market. So the market starts going up, 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 up. And when you think that part of the market, let's say the... Uh, consumer products companies or retail clothiers or something like that. They think those are going up, so they step into them and start buying them, and they do go up because they're buying them. They go up, they go up, and more consumers are buying stuff, so the, the companies are giving good numbers every quarter, and those stocks are moving forward. And when these fund managers think that maybe this is going to shift the other direction, they exit that part of the market and try to move somewhere else where it's been low. And that momentum strategy to try to catch the the rocket launches of each industry is how they try to beat the market. And not surprisingly, basically nobody ever does in the long run, except for people like Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, David Einhorn, guys like that, crush the market in the long run. But they're not momentum investors. Those guys are what we call rule one investors. They're focusing entirely on buying $10 bills and buying them for $5 and they don't track the momentum of the market. If anything, they probably go the opposite direction. The natural vicissitudes of life. Present opportunities. Present opportunities. As opposed to problems, <laughs> right? So the natural vicissitudes of life are what are scary to the vast majority of people who are investing money and are what are opportunities to these rule one investors. All right, so big question. Yeah. How do we know if it's a $10 bill for $5? All right. So we've sort of discussed that there's two different theories out there. The theory that it can't be, mm -hmm. right? And then the theory that, at least in the short run, the market can misprice things because of emotions of fear and greed. So let's assume that um, we really believe that Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett are correct and that occasionally the market will misprice something. How do we know what it's worth? That's what you're asking, right? Okay, so again, we kind of go back to Charlie here and we ask, well, okay, what is what are the steps that Charlie went through there that tell us ultimately how we would get to the value of this business? And the first step was, are you capable of understanding the business as a business? Do you understand what they're doing when they're making t-shirts? Do you understand what they're doing when they're drilling for oil? Whatever it is, right? Do you understand what... Um, you know, the gap does if you want to invest in a clothing store. So you have to be capable of understanding the business, first off. Second, you have to know, because you understand the business, you have to know that it has some kind of intrinsic characteristic that gives it a long-term durable edge in the market or a niche in the market. That's super key. All right, so first, do you understand it? And second, does it have this critical feature to it 
that gives it, that has an intrinsic characteristic that we call a moat, like the water around the castle that protects it. Does it have that? Third, Charlie says, we would like it to also have talented management that have integrity. But the first two things are really where you're going to put your attention. And once you sort of think you're capable of understanding that part of the market, let's say, uh, you know, casual fast food or what do they call it, whatever they, you know, like Chipotle grill kinds of restaurants. Let's say you figure like, okay, I can understand that stuff. That's where I eat every time. So let me just dig in and understand it. So assuming you, you feel capable of understanding that market, then your research becomes whether this company has a durable competitive advantage, that it has that niche and can hang on to it. It's the durability part that's really key because here's what you're gonna to do to figure out the value of the business. You're going to say that what's been going on historically here, the, the, this business has been around for 10 years or something, and I can look out and see what it's been doing. And because it has this niche or this durable competitive advantage, this moat, I can see that it'll be able to continue that for a long time. And if I can see that, then I can put a value on it. How are those two things related? If I can see that, how does that help you put a value on it? Well, Do you this, look backwards at the historical numbers? I'm going to look backwards at the historical numbers, and I'm going to say, okay, that's what it's been doing over a long period of time. And we want to look way back because we, we want to take out the valleys and the mountains, the ups and the downs of this business. We want to just kind of say, you know, if we were to kind of smooth its last 10, 15, 20 years out through all of the the vicissitudes of life, what would the overall growth rate of this business look like? What would the cash flow look like and how is it growing? That's kind of what we'd be asking ourselves. And then you would project that into the future. And then we'd project it into the future. And so we're looking out the back window of the car at the road behind, knowing full well that looking out the front window, we're looking into the fog. And, but we're not driving real fast. And we if we really see a straight road back there and we understand what the road should look like in the future, we can make a pretty good projection, ballparking, what this cash flow looks like out into the future. So I said two things a minute ago. I said the cash flow and the, how it's growing. The first and most important thing is that it has cash flow, that we have this owner's cash or free cash flow that comes into us that if we own the entire business, we could put in our pocket every year. Because ultimately, that's what I need out of this business is a return on my money. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my money to work and I want my money to come back to me. So please come back to me. So first thing I want back is my money. So I want return of my money. And then I want a return on the risk I took, on the money that I put into this investment. So what I'm hoping to see here is some real steady cash flow into the future. Now, what Charlie said is, you figure that cash flow into the future and you can come to a conclusion about a price that makes sense. But because there's ups and downs in life, we can't just go pay the price that makes sense. We have to get a margin of safety on that price. So we're going to discount that price so that even if the cash flow isn't what I thought it was, I bought the thing at about half of what it was worth as a public company. And because I did, I can bounce through the vicissitudes of life over the next 10 years, and I'm going to be able to sell this for more than I paid for it down the road sometime. And I just listened to Warren Buffett talk about owning John Deere, and he said, you know, it, he doesn't talk in specifics too much about companies he's still acquiring, and I think he's still acquiring John Deere stock right now as I'm speaking. And they said, why did you buy it? And he said, well, because I think in 10 years, you know, given the fact that the world is going to have 9 billion people instead of 7 billion people and food is what they need, John Deere is going to be worth more in 10 years than it is today. We didn't say, how does he figure out what it's worth today? So that's what we're going to talk about right now is how do we know what it's worth today? Cool? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're talking about sort of how to get to the value of the business, right? How do you do that? Yeah. All right. So Charlie's basically saying that we want this business that we understand with a big durable competitive advantage that's going to throw off a certain amount of cash flow, and we're going to take that cash flow, and we're going to figure out the value of the business based on recognizing that we're not going to pay 
as much for dollars we're not going to get for the next five or ten years as we would pay for dollars today. So if a business was making a million dollars a year with no growth at all, but it, it, it just could increase its prices by, let's say, inflation. So Their profit is a million dollars a year? Yeah, profit's a million dollars a year. What would you pay to buy that million dollars? You would pay some multiple of the million. Right, so let's figure it out. Let's say you wanted to buy a river touring company, since I'm an old ex-river guide in the Grand Canyon. These are almost monopoly companies. There's only like 12 of them down there. And they're protected by the federal government from competition. Um, there's a little risk because you have to renew your license every five years, but no one's ever lost theirs. So, you know, pretty risk-free business, but not a growth business. You can't grow it. You can only just keep up with inflation. So let's say that our perfect little business here is a river touring company that makes a million dollars after tax every year. And let's say that I'm, I'm not this old, but let's say I was 78 years old and you don't like the river touring business. You're my daughter and you don't really like it. Um, and so we want to sell this business to somebody so that I can just live off the last of my years in, on a beach and you don't have to mess with this river touring company. You just want the cash and go on with your life. So how much would we sell it for? Let's figure this out, you and I together, because you'd, you'd like to get as much as possible, so would I. It's making a million a year. So let's have a conversation. How much should I sell it for, Danielle? Well, it depends on the industry. For, I, I don't know the answer. It depends on the industry to know what multiple people generally use. So I've heard everything from multiples of like 5 to 12, depending on the industry. Oh, that's pretty good. That's not, that's not that bad, actually. And um, the industry side of things is actually more about whether it cycles, whether it goes through ups and downs a lot, you know, or whether it doesn't. Uh, so some industries are really steady and they don't go through business cycles much and people are willing to pay more for that than a business that goes ups and downs, ups and downs. This particular business is like on railroad tracks. It doesn't matter almost what the... Uh, economic cycle is people still go down the Grand Canyon on rafts and they fill up those user days every year all the way to the max. So it's so limited. So it's so limited. Yeah. yeah. So this is like a million a year no matter what. So you probably get a little higher multiple in that range. So let's say if we're making a million a year in constant dollars, then we could think in terms of the very upper part of that range, we could try to sell it for $12 million. So what makes you just decide that and pick that? Well, You can justify it to a buyer? Well, I think you, you named it a range, and I'm kind of going with it. Let's just go with that range, wherever you got that number. That was the most that range went, 5 to 12, and we're saying 12 million. So now let's put on our buyer hat. Well, well first off, let's, let's keep our seller hat on for a second. Why would we accept $12 million today in exchange for a million dollars a year that's going to go on for the rest of your life. Why would we do that deal? So we can stop running the company. Yeah, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. But let's even say that the managers of the company run it really well. I really don't do that much. Well, then I say keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, because that's a smart, it's actually quite smart to say keep it because you're going to get a million dollars, a million dollars, a million dollars. But if you think about it, you're about to get $12 million worth of that business all up front. Right. So you take your 12 and you invest it. Da, da, da. Yeah. And you make more money on your, on your 12. That's what you're saying. No, but it's good to thought. No, let's take a look at that. You're not making more money on your 12? Yeah, you are. But let's say, okay, you take the 12 and the federal government takes 2.5 because of tax. Let's just round it off to two. So you've got 10 now. Um, and with that 10, you can invest it in a long-term T-bill at 3% a year and get $300,000 a year forever. Forever. Yeah. So that's kind of nice. I mean, it's less than a million. It's less than a million. But it's kind of nice. But it's guaranteed, and you don't have to do anything. Didn't we stipulate that this business is pretty much guaranteed? Yeah, this is pretty much guaranteed. So it's the difference between pretty much guaranteed and guaranteed. Right. Which is so the difference, then that difference being... is apparently $700,000. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's like on <laughs> on the Princess Bride. The difference between being all the way dead <laughs> mostly and just dead. mostly dead. <laughs> pretty substantially important. So there's always risk with a business. You can't avoid that, right? There's no certainty. Um, and there's no, there's the most certainty you can get with money is we just say a U.S. Treasury bond for 30 years, which is considered risk-free. So we get 300,000 bucks a year in. So that's one reason we might want to look at what we're going to get paid for this thing. Is that enough to make it worth doing the deal? Um, but we don't want to forget, we've also got the principal. We've got the whole $10 million sitting there. And if we wanted to, we could amortize this, the distribution of that $10 million over a bunch of years. And you might find yourself getting five or $600,000 a year for the next 30 years before it's fully distributed. And then you might think, well, that's pretty good, actually. I'm going to get five or $600,000 a year for the next 30, 40 years. I have no risk whatsoever. Um, that might be why you'd be willing to take 10 or 12 million for the business. Okay. All right. Why are we talking about selling our private business? Because we're trying to figure out the value of a thing. Okay. Right. Which is really important. What we're talking about is like figuring out the value of this business. So we can already see, we're kind of wondering if we're really getting enough money at 12 million to be worth selling off this million dollars a year forever. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you're a buyer, you're looking at it this the absolute opposite way. You're looking at it and saying, I have $12 million in my pocket. And I want to put that to work. Now, why would I not just go get the T-bill? Well, because I think by taking some risk above the risk-free rate, I could get more money per year. All right, so I'm going to look at buying this company, and I'm going to think, how much would I be willing to pay for it? Um, Considering that every five years they have to renew the license, considering there may be some huge terrorist attack and it just shuts down all tourism everywhere in the country, considering that, who knows, something might change and they may dam up the Grand Canyon. It's proposed every year to put in five <laughs> more dams uh, to feed power and you know out to Phoenix or something. So there's always the vicissitudes that Charlie's talking about mm -hmm. that we have to deal with. So I'd be willing to exchange my $12 million for some chunk of vicissitudes. And I got to decide if I want to do it for this company. But we can see right away we're, we're, we, we might be negotiating about a price here, but it's not an infinite price on one side and nothing on the other. There's a place in the middle here where we're going to get um, if you're a willing seller and I'm a willing buyer. And I'm guessing it's in the ballpark of right where we're talking about right now. And the reason I'm guessing that is because most private businesses aren't that much of a lock. You know, they don't, they're not that perfect. Well, and most private businesses that are purchased are purchased in order to grow them. And this one really doesn't have any growth opportunities. No growth so opportunities here at all. rather unique. Yeah, no growth opportunities. It can't be rather unique. unique. It's rather unusual. <laughs> 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 and so the... the the value of this business is going to be in this ballpark. I mean, give or take a two or three million dollars. We're pretty close to the value. It, it won't be 20 million, right? It won't be 20 million because I'm not ready to part with 20 million dollars to get a million a year. Let me put it in really stark terms. I'm not going to get my money back for 12 years. Right. That's a long time to wait to get my risk off the table. Now, granted, my risk is getting less every year, but come on, man, that money could be working someplace at at least 300000 a year, and I'm, I, I want to get rid of that risk. So 12 years to get my money back is a long time. 20 years? Forget it. You want to hear how crazy things can get in the public markets, just as an aside? If, yes. If the P-E ratio is the amount of time that it takes to get your money back, let's say if you have no growth of the business whatsoever, the price that you're paying divided by your earnings tells you the number of years that it'll take to get your money back. So let's say you spend $12 million on this company. Um, we make a million a year. So the P-E ratio, the price of the company is $12 million. The earnings are a million. The P-E ratio is 1 divided into 12, or 12. So the P-E ratio here is 12. So that means if there's no growth, it would take me 12 years to get my money back. Okay, Yahoo had a P-E ratio in 1999 of 11,000. Whoa! <laughs> So if there's no growth in Yahoo, it would take 
11,000 years to get your money back. So that meant people putting their money in there thought there would be enormous growth. So then you apply what enormous growth would mean to Yahoo's revenues and earnings, and it turned out that within 20 years or something, ballpark, Yahoo would have to be the size of the entire economy of the United States. When was this? This is 1999. Oh, gosh. To justify that price, <laughs> Yahoo would have to grow so fast that it would take over the GDP of the entire country. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they were paying a little too much for Yahoo. I feel like that's all you need to say when it comes to efficient market <laughs> hypothesis. <laughs> that is a pretty good data point, isn't it? That's just insane. That's insane. And people get crazy. It, it's like it bubbled and we, yeah. went past rationality yeah. into just pure momentum. I bought it. Somebody will buy it for more. Okay, so back to our, our river touring company here to try to understand how we would get to a value. One of the critical things is we call the payback time, how long it would take me to get my money back off the table if this is a private company. Well, um, the what average... What is that called in the investment world? I don't know. Oh. I'm, I, there's probably some name for it, but hey, man, I wrote a whole book about it, so called payback time, as you know. So it wasn't a real popular thing to discuss in the regular world. So I don't know if anybody calls it anything, but I know that that's how we look at businesses as a private investor in terms of how long is it going to take me to get my money back. So, and I'm sure there's some yield to purchase price thing that they've got in you know business school that matches that. And we're going to get a lot of letters telling us exactly what that I'm, is. I'm I sure there's a term for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is too. I'm sure they, they've got something at NYU that's exactly that thing. So that's one way you look at the value of a business is, am I willing to wait that long to get my money back? And that's what private equity does. Now, here's the cool thing. We know from being in the business for a long time that there's a standard in the industry of venture capital and private equity, what these guys will pay for a business. And the average is what you just said, five to 12, which actually averages at around seven and a half. Seven and a half to eight is ballpark, a good company, private company, not a laundromat, you know, but something that's growing, and what they would be willing to pay for that risk to yeah. go in. Yeah. So there you go, about eight years if there's no growth. And um, I think as we discussed before, you know, your Uncle Steve had his company go out there and it sold in a, a, sold in a range of, he didn't want me to give the exact number, but in a range of six to 10 on the uh, earnings before taxes. So six to 10 for his company. And it was growing pretty good. Um, and it went for 86 million. So you could extrapolate back from that to get to kind of what he was doing in terms of the earnings of the company. And it's right there in the ballpark of what we were talking about. So this is a really important data point for public market investors is to know that private market investors are paying an average of seven and a half or eight times earnings. And they'll pay a little more. It goes up to 10 or 12 if there's growth there or if there's some sort of monopoly. right? They'll pay a little more. But they're not paying an infinite amount. That's what Charlie said. It's not an infinite amount. Right. It's not infinite and there's some sort of sense to it. Yeah. There's an actual range that is legitimately rational. It's like, okay, how long am I willing to wait to get my money back with the amount of risk that's involved in this business? And it's going to be a range. It's not infinite. And so that means that businesses, unlike Picasso's, have a very rational way of arriving at their value, at least within a range of the value. And what Charlie is saying is, come up with that range of value and then buy it for half of that. And that's your margin of safety. You said earlier that the, on the public market, companies are generally valued at twice what they are on the private market. Right. So essentially, are we looking to buy a company at the price it would be in the private market, yeah. on the public market? Yes. We want to buy a public company at a private company price. Now, let me give you a couple of data points on... on uh, public companies that are kind of help you figure out if I'm, you know, if I'm in the ballpark of reality here. The P.E. ratio for public companies for the last 140 years has averaged about 15. Okay, let's go earnings. back. P.E. ratio. Yeah. Price to earnings ratio. Price to earnings ratio. Can you just say again how you get that? Yep. You take the price of the company and divide it by the earnings mm -hmm. and you get a number. You get a number. Right. Which is the P.E. ratio or price to earnings ratio. And what is and used... And that's a commonly used number. Very commonly used. Now, 
it's it's a very quick and dirty way to kind of get an idea how expensive or cheap a company is. Because remember, on the private markets, we were looking at somewhere between five and twelve. So essentially, about double. You know, you could have it could be X or it could be two X, depending on what that multiple is. Um, so it's pretty significant, but it isn't infinite. And in the public markets, it's 15 average for the S&P 500. Now, these are the biggest companies. And they don't grow real fast. So the average growth rate, including dividends, of those companies over the last 100 years has been about 7.5% per year. And so if they're growing at 7.5% per year and they get a PE of 15, there's a neat little thing you can do right there, is you can figure out the actual figure out what the PE ratio should be of any company that's public by doubling its growth rate, its long-term historical growth rate of its earnings. That's what it should be, not what it is. It's what it should be, and it'll vary depending on whether we're in a really robust, Mr. Market is manic and just overly exuberant bull market, or whether we're in Mr. Market is depressed and anxious and fearful bear market. If it's typical, it'll be about 15 on the S&P 500, and in a bull market, double the level, double the, the earnings growth rate would be typical. In a bear growth, market, it won't be that high. Growth rate over how long? Oh, uh, long-term growth rates, like 10 years. 10 years average growth rate, something like that, right? So the public markets tend to be priced quite rationally relative to the liquidity and the knowledge and the information that's out there about them. They're priced at about double what private, the same private company would go for, and that the major point of this is that those prices are in a very defined range. They're not infinite. Okay, so now we've kind of got a, an idea of what, how to figure out the value of that business, what people are willing to pay for it. Because it's coming from how long is it going to take me to get my money back? What's the return on my money over a period of time? And that's in a relatively narrow range. So people are saying, yeah, I'll be willing to wait 8 or 10 years to get my money back if it's a good business. Or they're saying, yeah, I would be willing to get, you know, some rate of return on my money over time to take the risk. Now, let's, let's step into that little number real quick because everybody uses a different number depending on what kind of businesses they're out to buy. We're looking at buying businesses that have, um, the, have are really solid. We understand them. They have a great durable competitive advantage. And we're putting um, a, a factor on discounting the value of all that cash flow in the future back to today as another way of looking at the value. So you're moving from payback time. The number we were just talking about, which is the payback time. Right. The to, number of years it's going to take to get your money back. Right. To a new number, which is in business school called a discounted cash flow analysis, or you're looking forward. Right, which we just say is a margin of safety price where we're looking forward. So what we do with this, we can go into these numbers and in, in the next time yeah, let's, can we next time, and this time let's do an overview. Yeah. And next time let's talk about where you actually find these numbers. Okay, we'll, we'll get into where you find them. Um, and what to do with How them. do you know whether they're going to continue to be that number that you found historically, right? Yeah. Warren Buffett said if it was just a matter of looking out, you know, at the history of a company, then all librarians would be rich. You know, she's like, <laughs> it's, not, it's not just a matter of that. Right, and for people who are not very interested in investing, most people... The numbers are the scariest part. They're kill they, they're very killer and and they're very um, and you know they're intimidating. Um, the good news is there are six basic numbers we really pay a lot. Seven basic numbers we pay attention to. Okay. Eight basic oh, numbers. Oh, stop it! <laughs> Let's go back to two. There's only nine basic. Okay, so there's a handful. All right. Of basic numbers, and we'll get into those. Um, but there's really just two really good ways to look at the value of a business. The first way we talked about, which is sort of private equity looking at buying a private business in a range of this 5 to 12 times earnings, depending on the growth and safety of it all. And then in a public business, looking at some PE multiple of the growth rate. PE multiple of the growth rate. So 2x the growth rate effectively gives you a way to figure out the value of the business. And then we're going to apply um, what's called a discounted cash flow analysis. Sorry, you're getting way in the weeds, aren't I? Why <laughs> did you go from PE number, which we discussed, yeah. to 2x the growth rate? Ah. And we 
have not discussed how those things relate exactly. Okay, I think we're gonna have to okay, pick maybe that, that up to next wait time. For our numbers conversation. We, we've got to pick that up next time because that's gonna involve some heavy lifting. Okay. To look at why growth rate tells gets you to the value of the business. Okay. So if we stipulate that somehow it does, and we'll believe you on that for the moment. Okay. But only for the moment. Then. Let's move forward. <laughs> okay. So discounted cash flow was the other thing that you wanted to talk yep. about. So essentially, that's that's the key thing. I think we actually ought to stop here because oh, okay. I think what we got to do is say, look, there's these two ways to value the business. Looking at the payback time is pretty straightforward from a private point of view. Um, and how do we extrapolate that into the public markets? And then the second way is a discounted cash flow analysis that we call the margin of safety analysis. How do we come up with that value that we get a margin of safety on? And we're going to talk about that next time. Talk about those two in those detail. Those two in detail. I think that sounds good because okay. I'm already confused. Okay, good. Then okay. We'll, we'll take that confusion and we'll roll it right into the next one. And the next one's going to be a very clear and concise and easy to understand. Because <laughs> Charlie said this is simple. It's so simple. What would they do the rest of the semester? <laughs> so we're going to show you how simple it is. Oh, I feel like Next Charlie time. hangs out with a bunch of nerdy number people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then until next time, I think it's time to go play. What do you say? Yeah, okay. okay, let's go. See you. Thanks for listening to Invested, the Rule One podcast. If you like us, please subscribe and leave a review for us on iTunes. You can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and get more information about how to invest on your own by going to ruleonepodcast.com. Everything we've discussed in this podcast is either Danielle's opinion or my opinion and is not to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only and I hope you've enjoyed it. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.